Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're talking all about cardiomyopathy. We have a few different types to cover, but before we jump in, let's review our practice question. The nurse is caring for a client admitted with fatigue, orthopnea, and bilateral lower extremity edema. The echocardiogram shows an ejection fraction of 25%. Which provider prescription would the nurse question? We have A, administering furosemide IV push Q12. B, beginning enalapril at 2.5 milligrams orally every day. C, starting metoprolol at 25 milligrams orally twice a day, or D, encouraging the client to increase their fluid intake to three liters per day. All right, save where you think the right answer might be. We will circle back to it at the end. But first, we're breaking down cardiomyopathy. A big word, honestly, guys, it basically just means disease of the heart muscle, cardio heart, myo muscle, so the heart muscle, pathy disease. We got a disease going on, okay? The structure or function of the heart muscle is abnormal. And when the muscle of the heart is not working right, then the pump that keeps your whole body alive starts to fail. Going back to our basic anatomy, you know the heart is a four-chambered pump and its job is pushing blood forward. Every beat pushes blood forward that brings oxygen to every cell in the body. So the muscle of the heart has to be strong, flexible, and well-coordinated. It has to have all three of these properties to be able to keep moving that blood forward, which is basically saying to maintain our cardiac output. So if we get a disease of that heart muscle, one or more of those features is disrupted. Either the muscle is too thick, it is too stretched out, or it is too stiff. Any of those things are going to lead to decreased cardiac output, poor perfusion. We're not getting oxygen to our cells. Now, the type of cardiomyopathy that we have is just how is that heart muscle diseased, okay? Is it too thick? Is it too stretched out? Or is it too stiff? If it is too stretched out, that is a dilated cardiomyopathy. And this I'm starting with because it's actually most common. Basically, I want you to think the heart muscle is like a balloon that's been stretched out too many times. You know how if you blow a balloon way up, it like doesn't go back to its normal shape, right? Or if you stretch a hairband out. That's what happens in dilated cardiomyopathy. The heart chambers, especially that left ventricle, become enlarged and weak. The muscle wall gets thin and flabby, and as a result, the heart cannot squeeze effectively. So even though the chamber is big, it can't push all of the blood out. All right, a lot of that blood is just staying in that deflated balloon that's all stretchy and thin, okay? That leads to heart failure because we're not moving that blood forward. Our ejection fraction is reduced. We're not getting oxygen out to our cells. So all of those downstream effects, like we're retaining fluid, that fluid's in our lungs, so we're short of breath, et cetera, et cetera. What can cause dilated cardiomyopathy? Infections, alcohol use, chemo drugs, even some genetic factors. I like to think of this as a floppy pump. All right, so that's type one. The heart muscle is too stretched out. Kind of the opposite of this is if the heart muscle gets too thick, and that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What happens here is the left ventricle gets enlarged, which makes the chamber space, like what's inside of the left ventricle, much smaller. So that means it's hard for the heart to fill with blood during diastole, when it's relaxing. This is a diastolic problem. Dilated cardiomyopathy was a systolic problem. The muscle was too floppy to push forward. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a diastolic problem. That muscle is too thick, our chamber too small, so it cannot relax and fill. Blood has a hard time getting in. This condition is often genetic and can cause sudden cardiac death, especially in young athletes. Key features you need to know are they'll have a murmur, syncope, chest pain with exertion because they can't get that cardiac output up, 
and a risk of arrhythmias. Now, one more way we can have a disease of the heart muscle is if it gets too stiff. It's not too big, stretched out, and floppy, or too large. It just cannot move like it should. This is restrictive cardiomyopathy. Much less common, very serious. The heart muscle becomes stiff, not stretched, not rigid. It just can't move. Therefore, it cannot fill properly. So it looks like the right size, but it's like trying to pour water into that balloon, but it will not expand. It will not stretch out. So it can just only take so much fluid before pressure builds up. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, normal size balloon, but it is not stretchy. All right. It is usually caused by infiltrative diseases such as amyloidosis or sarcoidosis from radiation or chemo damage. Like I said, this one is more rare, but it also leads to both diastolic and systolic dysfunction because it can't stretch to accommodate blood or pump and get blood out, okay? So let's quickly review cardiomyopathy, muscle of the heart, has a disease, it's damaged, three ways it can happen. It is dilated, that balloon is stretched, so the pump really can't move anything forward. It is too big, hypertrophic, that thick muscle blocks blood from going out. And restrictive, that balloon is just stiff, it cannot expand to fill. So in my clinical practice, I have only had a few cases of cardiomyopathy. This is not something I saw a ton as a peds nurse, but I did have at least one case of dilated, a couple cases of hypertrophic in like teenage athletes. But I'm specifically gonna zero in on dilated cardiomyopathy today because that is a lot more common. So in my time in the emergency department, I had a 62-year-old come in. It was a 62-year-old male, and his wife is who brought them in. She said he had not been himself for weeks, and it had taken her weeks to convince him he actually had to come in. Basically, he was just getting more tired. She said, like, hey, he can barely make it up the stairs. Usually, he's much more active. Over the past few days, he had developed a nagging cough and his ankles started getting really swollen. So he's, of course, brushing it off. He's like, it's hot, it's the summer, whatever, I've got a cough. But what tipped the scales was he stopped being able to sleep lying down. So we all know that's a heart failure picture when you need to be propped up it's because you can't breathe when you're flat if there's too much fluid on your lungs, right? That was what prompted him like, okay, something's going on. I guess I'll let my wife take me in. So they came in. It was like around lunchtime. It was not a crazy busy day or anything. So we, we were able to kind of take our time and get them settled in pretty quick. Starting off with assessment, he was significantly tachycardic. If memory serves, he was tacky to the 120s. And his BP was very, very high. Not high enough to be a hypertensive crisis, but in like the 160s to 170s systolic. High enough where like, ooh, wowza. Like, so this is not so good, you know? And with someone that age, you're like, have you been living with this for a long time? Like, you know, we start asking questions. Uh, respirators were fine, like in the mid 20s. His oxygen was a little lower than I wanted to it, right around like 90 on room air. And he did not have a history of COPD. So I would have liked to see that 95 plus, but he wasn't blue or anything, you know? So vitals are not great, but they're stable. You know, he's not crashing that moment. We're going into the full assessment. And immediately when I auscultate his lungs, they are crackly. Snack, crackle, pop. There is obviously fluid bilaterally. I'm hearing just like tons of crackles. And looking him over, he has got pitting edema everywhere. I would say like plus two on the uppers, plus three on the lowers. And I even feel like I could see a little bit of JVD when I leaned him back and could see that venous distension. He, he was the picture of fluid overload. So pause here for a second. You've got someone coming in, they've got hypertension, dyspnea, needing to sit up, crackles. Think through all the symptoms I just told you. What type of cardiomyopathy does that suggest? Is it a stretched out balloon that can't move that blood forward? Is it a hypertrophic heart where that muscle is thick or restrictive where it can't move very well? 
dilated is immediately what I want you to be thinking. Because remember, this is our systolic failure. It is stretched out. It can't push that blood forward. And if our ventricle can't move blood forward, that left ventricle can't get the blood out to the body, where is it going to back up? In the lungs. So as soon as I heard all those crackles, we, we knew blood was backing up in the lungs, right? Fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, the crackles. His heart is not pumping effectively. So with dilated cardiomyopathy, left ventricle is enlarged and stretched out. Remember, it's like that worn out balloon. The wall is too weak to generate a good squeeze. So blood's backing up, backing up into the lungs. Hello, crackles, orthopnea, pooling in the extremities, you know, cue the swollen ankles. And overall, his heart is just not perfusing the body. So that's why he's been wiped out and kind of wearing down over the past few weeks. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, with an O2 sat of 90 on room air, I did go ahead and put him on just two liters nasal cannula. Didn't need to be anything wild, but we did want to see that a little bit up and it made him more comfortable as well. Other priorities included diagnostics, right? We needed to get labs. Important ones for him were a BNP and troponins and a 12 lead ECG. I also, when I started those labs or when I drew those labs, I needed to go ahead and start my IV, like to go ahead and get that in one poke. So I was pretty sure he was going to need some imaging and further medications. They also went ahead and got a chest x-ray and an echo. The echo is really what is diagnostic here for cardiomyopathy. That is what's going to look at the structure of the heart. How well is it functioning? How much blood is it pumping out? And on his echo, they saw that only 25% of the blood in his left ventricle was getting pumped out with each beat of the heart. So that's a 25% ejection fraction the fraction of the blood being ejected by the heart. That is not so good. Anything below 30 makes me really nervy. I do not like that at all. It's not 100%. Normally, it's more like in the 70-ish, 25%, no bueno. So what they think likely happened, now, I didn't see him after the ED, so I'm only getting the story from the, you know, cardiologist visit down to the emergency department, but it looks like he had had long-standing hypertension. That blood pressure I got on admission in the, I think the systolics was in the 170s. It had been sitting there for a while. So that left ventricle had been working, trying to push against a really high afterload, and that had stretched it out. That had really just worn it out. So what we needed to do right then and there, again, like initial stabilization in the emergency department, um, was make it easier for his heart to pump. Our three main goals are get the preload down, all that extra fluid, we gotta get it off. Get that afterload down, all right? So make it easier for that left ventricle to actually pump the blood forward. And then help with that squeeze. Get that heart squeezing harder to move that blood forward. Essentially, y'all, I wanna get cardiac output up, okay? In short, everything we do with cardiomyopathy, and this applies to all three types, okay, is get the heart to pump more effectively. That's your key takeaway, all right? You are trying to enhance perfusion. Let's make it easier for the heart to do its job. Step one, get that preload down. We're going to give some IV diuretics. Ferrosamide will pull off the extra fluid, get rid of some of that edema, the crackles, Less fluid means less volume for that heart to push forward. So that eases the workload. All right, step two, let's get the afterload down. We're going to go ahead and give an ACE inhibitor. We did a nalopril for him to get the afterload down, get that blood pressure down. Less resistance for the left ventricle to pump against. We're going to move more blood forward. We're going to get cardiac output up. Third, we're going to go with a beta blocker. That slows the heart rate, that reduces myocardial oxygen demand, calms the sympathetic overdrive. And actually, over time, this is going to help with healthier cardiac remodeling. So this is great, you know, right now because we're helping that heart be more efficient. But long term, there's a lot of benefit to that as well. Okay. 
Now, those meds are important, but there are some non-farm things too. One is sodium restriction, okay? Less sodium, less water, and that decreases our preload. Less volume for the heart to pump, that is a good thing. Also want to keep an eye on that volume by taking daily weights. Every morning, same time, same clothes, same scale. Any gain more than three pounds in a week, red flag, fluids being retained, heart's not keeping up, we need to go see the doctor. All of this education, very important, okay? And they're doing this more so out on the floor when they're being discharged with these medications. But the client needs to know, hey, what are the signs and symptoms of heart failure? What are things that I should watch out for that mean like I'm doing worse? Like I suddenly gain weight. I'm short of breath. I've got to sleep in my recliner. I have bad swelling. Any of those things where they're retaining fluid, if I'm holding on to fluid, my heart's not moving it forward. So that's heart failure. I need to go see the doctor, okay? Now, he got moved up to the floor pretty quickly after we got those diagnostics. He was going to be discharged with all those meds we talked about. He was going to be going straight to the cardiologist uh, for more long-term treatments. And those treatments are all going to be aimed at making it easier for that heart to pump. So with that being said, let's circle it back to our practice question and now see if you can get to that right answer and understand why. You've got a client with fatigue, orthopnea, and bilateral lower extremity edema. The echo shows an ejection fraction of 25%. So that's pretty much our, our, our gentleman who came into the ED, right? Of these prescriptions, which one are we going to question? Which one are we going to raise our hand and say, hmm, I'm not so sure about this? Is it A, giving furosemide IV push every 12 hours? B, beginning enalapril 2.5 milligrams orally every day? C, starting metoprolol at 25 mg orally twice a day? Or D, encouraging the client to increase their fluid intake to three liters per day. Say it out loud with me. A, B, C, D, what are we questioning? It's D, right? We don't want them to increase that fluid intake. You know, I'm all for staying hydrated. Like, you know, I've always got my water bottle ready to go. But this client has a fluid problem. They have orthopnea. They have edema. And their ejection fraction is pretty crummy. We're only getting 25% of the blood in our heart out to our body. So that means that fluid is instead backing up in the lungs. We need to get rid of that fluid. So decreasing that preload, that includes reducing sodium, restricting fluids, and giving IV diuretics. That's A, giving furosemide, correct. We also need to make it easier for the heart to pump. So that's B, giving the enalapril, an ACE inhibitor, to decrease that afterload. And we also just need to help that heart pump a little bit. So the metoprolol, the beta blocker, that's going to slow the heart rate, make it more efficient. ABC, all really good interventions for someone with a cardiomyopathy. What we don't want to do is increase that fluid intake. If anything, it should come down. Because remember, what's our key takeaway? If we've got cardiomyopathy, all of our interventions are about making it easier for the heart to pump. Cardiomyopathy, disease of the heart muscle. Heart muscle's not working so good. Blood's not going forward. And that's a big problem for our body. So let's make it easier for that heart to pump, get that preload down, that afterload down, squeeze that heart a little, and we'll be getting an increased cardiac output, better perfusion, and our client will feel so much better. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.